Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. And if you're new to my channel, hello, my name is Gabby and welcome. If you've never been here before, never watched any of my videos, have no idea what I do here on my channel. I cover true crime cases and all the cases that I cover are a little bit older. They're all basically 20 years or older. So if that's something that you might be interested in, maybe go down below, click that subscribe button and also make sure to turn on the post notifications to be notified every time that I upload. So in December, when I was covering Jane and John Doe cases for December, I had so many people requesting and honestly wondering why I was not covering the case of the boy in the box. This is because I wanted to kick off the new year with that case because it was one of the biggest updates we have had in a case in quite some time. He has finally, after 65 years, been identified. I know that a lot of us who are interested in true crime cases are quite familiar with this case already, but this is just a case that has been so requested for me to cover, especially recently. And I try to give the people what they want. I try to give my viewers the videos that they want and request. So that's why I'm covering it today. And we're going to be taking this one back to 1957. Now, before I get into it, I wanna be completely honest with you all that when it comes down to exactly how the boy was found, it is very hard to map out the series of events because every single source out there says basically the same thing, but just a little bit different. I tried to piece together everything as best as I could and I went off of one of the original sources. On the chilly day of Sunday, February 24th of 1957, Frederick Bononis, a 26 year old junior attending LaSalle College in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, made a gruesome discovery on his way home. A discovery he didn't know the intensity of or reality of at the time. According to the Philadelphia Inquirer released on the 27th, Frederick told authorities that he was driving his car on Sunday. He was just off Susquehanna Road near Vury Road in Philadelphia's Fox Chase section when he saw a rabbit dart out in front of his car. He said he got out and chased it, but lost sight of it in the underbrush. That while doing this off of the road after chasing the rabbit, he saw some unset muskrat traps and decided to set them and come back to the location later and see what happened if it caught anything. While he was doing this, he immediately spotted something that caught his attention a lot more. A box. It was a cardboard box under some brush that had once contained some type of furniture, but now contained something far different. Frederick didn't examine it too much at this time. All he saw in the box was a head, and he thought the box simply contained a large doll. He found it odd, but didn't think too much of it, and soon left the scene to continue on with his day. But this was something that stuck out in his head because what if it wasn't just a doll? According to that same article released by the Philadelphia Inquirer, he returned the next day on Monday the 25th to see if the traps had been sprung. They hadn't been. He once again ignored the box and left. Some sources would later say different regarding why he was there. Some have stated that Frederick was there in that location and got out of his car because he had previously seen a rabbit go in that direction of the wooded area and wanted to make sure it was okay because traps had been in that area and that the day he found the box, he was there making sure no animals had been caught in a trap and then went back to make sure the traps were still unset. So it's a little bit of a different story. Like I said before, it is hard to find out exactly what happened, mostly due to how old this case is and stories getting changed a little bit over time. I mean, none of us were really there that day during the discovery, so can any of us say for certain? No, but. Frederick though, this time did consider reporting this strange sight to authorities, but he was hesitant at first for one main reason, he was afraid to get in trouble for occasionally being around that location for spying on some of the girls who attended Sisters of Good Shepherd, an all girls school about half a mile from his all boys school. It is said he had been caught by authorities once before doing this and coming to authorities with this new report may result in him looking even more suspicious to them than before. Well, a day later on Tuesday, February 26th, Frederick hears something on the radio that may makes him reconsider his decision to keep the secret to himself. The radio broadcast highlights the disappearance of a young girl. Mary Jane Barker had vanished the day before from Belmar, New Jersey. This makes Fred immediately think back to what he saw a day earlier. Could what he saw inside the mysterious box 
be the body of this missing little girl from an area only about 10 miles away. Frederick confided in others, including a priest and two faculty counselors, what he saw, and he was urged to notify authorities by all of them. Sergeant Charles Gargani picked up the call that Tuesday morning being told by Frederick that there was a box in the woods off Susquehanna Road that had what looked like a body inside of it. This would be the start of a very long running investigation and one of the most widely covered cold cases the United States has ever seen. The first one at the scene was police officer Elmer Palmer and walking up to this box changed his life. He would go on to tell the Philadelphia Inquirer in 2007, it's something you don't forget. This one was the one that bothered every day. Elmer Palmer walks closer to the large box sitting in the wooded area, a box with the dimensions of 35 by 19 by 15. He can see it says fragile on the side of it, meaning whatever inside needed to be handled with care which is ironic considering care is the last thing that what was inside had experienced. He peeks inside and this was definitely not a doll. This was a young boy's body. Elmer races back to his car and calls in backup. The next person who arrives is Sam Weinstein, who remembered for the rest of his life how sick he felt that day of the discovery. The next person after that that would arrive was Philadelphia's chief medical examiner, Dr. Joseph W. Spellman. All of these men worked relentlessly through the years on this case, and that day in late February of 1957 genuinely changed them as not only figures of authority, but people in general. They would actually, about a month later, end up finding out that Frederick was not the first individual to come across the box. It had actually been found days earlier by an 18 year old student, but he decided to not notify authorities of his findings because he had actually been in that area to check on his illegal muskrat traps that he had laid out. He would say it was because he was so startled by what he saw that he didn't want to tell anyone, not even his own parents. The family, they were also immigrants, so that also made him a bit cautious to go to authorities. Overall, he just didn't want to get in trouble with the law over these illegal traps of his, which illegal muskrat traps, spying on girls, not right, but authorities were obviously more focused at this time on the poor boy than whatever these men were doing in their free time. Frederick knew that since he was the first individual to come forward regarding the box, that they may have looked at him as possibly being involved. So he was very helpful in the investigation, answered any questions, and offered to take a polygraph test. He passed the test with flying colors and it seemed he was being truthful, so he was cleared of any suspicion. The boy was found nude inside the box, wrapped in what is often described as a native American patterned blanket. About 30 feet from the box, they did also find an adult sized blue cap that had a brown strap on the back. Other than the cap, they also found a child's scarf and a man's white handkerchief with the letter G in the corner. It is unknown if any of these items were in fact related to the case. The boy's autopsy would be conducted by chief medical examiner, Dr. Joseph W. Spellman. The boy was guessed to be between the ages of four to six, but he was extremely skinny. He stood at about three feet, six inches tall and weighed between 35 to 40 pounds. It was obvious that he was malnourished. Although malnourished, he did eat not long before his death because they did find baked beans in his stomach. He had quite a lot of bruising on his body. Other than bruising, there were also scratches and scarring. There was no evidence of actual surgeries or his bones being broken in the past and healing from that. And they also could tell that he had never been vaccinated. Some of these scars on him were noted as being surgical scars done with a sharp tool. This mostly referred to the ones on his ankle, chin, and groin. The one on his chin being described as L-shaped. In particular, his face showed the most bruising, and because of that, his cause of death was determined to be blunt force trauma. There was no getting around it. He was a homicide victim, one whose death was believed to have been taken place at a different location than the one where he was found at. They did not know exactly how long his remains had been in that location, but they guessed a few days due to there being quite a bit of rain in the days prior, yet the box he was in showed very little water damage at all. 
but the boy's hands and feet were described as being pruny, like they had been in some water for some time. How long he had been deceased, they guessed possibly a couple weeks. He was described though as being a very nice looking child with blue eyes and brown hair. His left eye actually fluoresced under a UV light, indicating there may have been recent exposure to a diagnostic dye that was commonly used in the treatment of chronic eye disease. His hair had been cut recently and what they described as being crudely cut in a crew style, so very close to his scalp. The haircut was also described as being non-professional and homemade. The cut was done so recently that they found clumps of his trimmed off hair on his body in the box. Other than his hair being freshly cut, his nails had also been recently trimmed and they guessed that the haircut and the nail trimming could have possibly happened after his death. Chief Inspector John J. Kelly told the Philadelphia Inquirer that the haircut was likely done shortly before or directly after he was killed to confuse his identity. How someone could do this to a child is something all of us with an actual heart will never understand. The boy would go on to be known as the boy in the box or America's unknown child for the next 65 years in this case. When it came to the box he was found in, they used the manufacturing code on it to find out where it originally came from. It had come from a JC Penney store on 69th Street in Upper Darby, located about 15 miles from where the boy's body was found. Inside the box had originally come a baby's bassinet. They wanted to know who purchased this bassinet from JC Penney. That could be the clue to solve all of it. The problem was that 11 other people had purchased bassinets from the same store. Now, eight of these people did come forward to help in the case. All of these eight people still had the boxes or told authorities they had unfortunately thrown out the boxes. The other four people who had purchased their bassinets were never located. One of those 12 boxes would be used to discard a child's lifeless body. Whether that be one of the four not located or one of the ones thrown out and the boy's killer or killers just saw it out in the trash one day and decided to use it in the way that it would be used. Or the box could have just been disposed of at that location beforehand since the area was used as an occasional dumping ground. But none of the eight people that came forward said they had disposed of their box in that location. What we do know is that the bassinet in the box originally sold somewhere between the dates of December 3rd, 1956 and February 16th of 1957 for $7.95, which today is $82.14. On to the next item. They tried to locate where the blanket may have come from. It had squares and diamonds on it in quite a few earthy tones. It was a blanket that had been cut into three pieces, but the third piece was nowhere to be found. Investigators handed it over to the Philadelphia Textile Institute to take a look at it, and they determined that the blanket was either made in North Carolina or Quebec. Canada. They couldn't narrow it down anymore from there because over one and a half million of these blankets had been sold. They also, of course, looked at the cap found near the scene. They discovered it came from a store in South Philadelphia owned by a woman named Hannah Robbins. The store's name was Robbins Bald Eagle Hat and Cap Company. It was a custom made cap and Hannah did remember making it specifically for a man that she described as being between the ages of 26 to 30 and came in by himself in his work uniform, but she didn't know where he worked. She said she unfortunately didn't see him again since and didn't write down any of his information. The sale was made with cash, not check, so she didn't know his name. So again, that got them nowhere. It would take six and a half decades for this boy's identity to be discovered in a case where at the very beginning of it, they thought he would be identified in no time. They took prints of his fingers and feet to keep on file and created a dental chart for him. This boy still had all of his baby teeth and had his tonsils. Now, Losing baby teeth can begin happening at different ages for different children, but it does most often occur around five years old. So they were starting to believe he was possibly four near five years old. Still, they couldn't really narrow that down for sure. You might be wondering why they took prints of his feet. Well, a man named Bill Kelly who worked with the department and was incredible at matching up prints went around to hospitals in the area trying to match up the boy's prints to 
baby footprints that they had on file from a few years back. Yeah, that's how determined people were working on this case to figure out who the boy was. This was of course a time before DNA testing and before they knew anything of the sort would even be available in the years to come. One of the first things they did was they wanted to see if the boy could have possibly come from any foster homes in the area. They contacted private welfare agencies to see if any of their wards were missing from any of their foster homes. That didn't get them anywhere. They then let people from the public come into view the boy's body to see if anyone possibly knew him. No one did, even though they did get their hopes up a few times with that. They took photos of the boy dressed up in a sitting position, making him look as alive as possible and spread those photos around the area to see if anyone came forward claiming they knew who he was. Again, this didn't get them anywhere closer to finding out who he was or where he came from. They tried to follow every single tip that came in, every bit of information that someone called into the department with. There were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of calls and letters coming in every week. One of the first bits of promising information that came in came from a man who said that he had been driving down Susquehanna Road on February 23rd when he spotted a woman and a small boy standing outside a vehicle. The man said that the woman was bent over looking in the trunk of the vehicle. He said that he pulled over and asked the two if they needed any help and that they just ignored him and kept their backs turned to him. He then just drove off, but the location where this occurred was only yards away from the exact spot the boy would eventually be found. The man unfortunately did not get a good look at either of the faces of the woman or the boy, and the two have never been located. But if the boy there that day was actually the boy in the box, that means that he didn't die weeks prior, he had died pretty much that day. There was a restaurant manager who thought that she had seen the boy at her restaurant with a man just a few days before the boy in the box was found. A sketch of this man was released to the public. Then there was a barber who thought he had cut the boy's hair, even though it seemed like the cut had been done by someone with no past experience in hair cutting and may have happened even after the boy's murder. There were a lot of tips flooding into the department at the very beginning of this case, but only a few were notable and ones that they put on the top of their list to really look into or believed that could have possibly happened. One of those was during March when a woman who came in to view the boy's body stated that she was positive. She had seen the boy on the bus only a few days before he was found, sleeping in the arms of a man that she guessed to be his father. She was actually a little bit of an artist herself, so she went home and drew up what she remembered the man looking like and handed that sketch over to the department. Years later though, a forensic artist Frank Bender would make a whole sculpture based off of the man that the woman had seen on the bus. Both of these were spread around with the hope someone may come forward knowing the man or the boy that he was with that day. This though, it didn't get them anywhere. The department sent out 4,000 flyers detailing the case to physicians and 10,000 flyers to police departments in just the first week since he was found. They just kept printing them out, sending them to any place they could. Schools, doctor's offices, dentist's offices, different facilities, departments, anywhere they could think of. Then they started sending them out in the mail with people's gas and electric bills, which this is always something that I think was very smart because of course everybody who lives at home gets a gas and electric bill. They wanted people to see this boy's photo. As spine chilling as the photos post-mortem of this boy were, they wanted people to see the photos, to talk about it, and maybe with people talking that it would get to the right person and someone would come forward knowing who he was. By April of 1957, Philadelphia police had received over 500 letters in relation to this boy's case. Also, for the first time in history, police worked alongside the Liquor Control Board, and as a result of this, even liquor stores in Pennsylvania had this boy's flyer up. His flyer was up everywhere around Pennsylvania, the entire state grocery stores at the post office, the salon, drug stores at bus stops and train stations. If you lived in Pennsylvania in 1957, I am sure you saw his flyer up 
somewhere at some time. After his body had been laid out at the morgue for months with no promising leads coming in, authorities decided it was time to finally give this boy a proper burial. They did not know for sure if the boy had come from that area or not, but people in that area cared for him like their own. The department with help from the Funeral Directors Association of Philadelphia gave him a funeral with Detective Samuel Powell, Detective Robert Bilton, Detective Andrew Widger, and Alan Retza of the medical examiner's office as his pallbearers. The boy was originally buried in a potter's field in Holmesburg, but would later be reburied at a larger plot with a more beautiful grave marker at Ivy Hill Cemetery in Cedar Brook, Philadelphia, after they exhumed his remains for DNA testing in 1998. Like I stated before, there were so many leads coming into the department, especially at the beginning of this case, and yes, over time, that became less and less and less, but still through the years, there were a lot of people calling in. I don't wanna to go too in detail with the theories because of course now we do know who the boy was, but if I covered this case without going through the theories, it wouldn't be the story in full. So I am going to go over the theories, but not as in detail as I would if this case was still completely unsolved. One of the first theories, and this was a theory that came very early in this case, came forward from Camden, New Jersey. Someone called into the department saying that the boy had to be Terry Spies, which was the son of a man in the area named Charles Spies. Multiple other calls came in claiming the same thing. Police truly thought with so many people so certain the boy may be Terry that possibly the boy is Terry, so they decided to send out an alarm regarding Charles. The first thing they did was they spoke to Charles's ex-wife, who had not seen her son Terry in over a year. She came into view the body of the boy and stated it definitely was not her son. For one, her son was eight years old and this boy was much younger. They finally tracked down Charles and when they did, they also located his son, Terry, who was calmly sitting in front of the home TV eating a sandwich. So he was perfectly fine. The boy in the box was not Terry Spies. The next theory was an early one as well and included a Marine named George Brumall in March of 1957, who thought that the boy could be his younger brother, Butch, which was just one sibling of 18. Butch had been left behind with his sister, Mary, to live with another older brother. The Marine would go to visit these siblings and when he arrived at the home, it was completely vacant. This Marine visited the boy's remains at the morgue multiple times, claiming the boy had to be his brother, Butch. Butch though would later be found perfectly fine in California, which was the place their parents originally left to go live. The next theory was a few years later. A man named Remington Bristow, who worked for the medical examiner's office, worked tirelessly on this case. And in the year 1960, reached out to a psychic who, through her so-called psychic abilities, eventually led him and investigators to a foster home. The foster home was ran by a man named Arthur Nicoletti and his wife, Catherine and Catherine's daughter from a previous marriage. The Nicoletti family was looking to get out of the business the following year of 1961 and decided to sell a lot of what they had used for their foster care. One of the things to be sold was a white bassinet similar to the one that came in the box originally. And there were also some blankets hanging on some clotheslines that looked almost identical to the cut up one that had been wrapped around the boy in the box. Some of their blankets at the home were also cut up. They claimed they cut them up to better fit the beds for the small children that they took care of. Arthur's stepdaughter, Anna Marie, who he would later marry after his wife died, had given birth to four children. Three had been stillborn, and the fourth, she claimed, died due to electrocution from a ride at a store at the age of three. Remington spent years stuck on this theory, thinking the boy in the box had come from this foster home. It took years for Arthur and Anna Marie to finally answer any questions and help cross themselves off the suspect list. The investigation was eventually taken over by Tom Augustine, who looked more into this theory and was finally able to conclude that the boy had no connection to the foster home, even though the home had been located only one and a half miles away from where he had been found. Back in 1961 though, another theory arose. A couple that worked with a few carnivals was arrested for the murder of one of their children. 
they would end up leading authorities to where the remains of four other of their children were. And it was thought maybe the boy could have been one of theirs, but turns out that he was not. Which that case, of course, is just completely tragic all on its own. Then there was the theory that possibly the boy could be Stephen Dummon, who was a boy who vanished from his stroller outside a bakery in Long Island, New York on Halloween day of 1955. His sister was also missing from outside the bakery, but she was later found only a few yards away. They thought for decades that the boy in the box could have been the missing boy from New York. There are dozens and dozens of theories in this case even one that emerged eventually from the forensic artist I mentioned before, Frank Bender, who claimed that maybe the boy lived his life as a girl instead of a boy and had quite long hair while alive that had been cut after death. And that's why no one recognized him. We would find out that that is not the case, but that is just another theory to add to the list. It would take me hours and hours and hours to go over all of the theories. The last main one that I wanna go over in this video occurred in 2002 when a woman came forward to police with a story that they definitely listened close to. The woman was an Ohio-based psychiatrist and told authorities that one of her patients, who's now known to the public as Martha or M gave her a full story that back during the summer of 1954, her parents bought a boy who was named Jonathan, or at least she knew him as Jonathan, and that this boy was abused on the regular, both physically and sexually by her mother for a couple of years until one night her mother beat him to death after trying to give him a bath. Some sources claim that Martha also stated that the boy had been throwing up baked beans the night that he was killed. Either way, her story goes, the mother was said to have killed the boy. Martha also went into great detail about the dumping of the body at the exact location he was found at, claiming he had been wrapped in a blanket and stuffed in a box that they found at the scene, which of course, authorities looked at the story and thought that this could possibly be true. The boy had eaten baked beans before he died and his hands and feet had been pruny, maybe because he had been in the bath. It all made sense but her story did not check out completely. And authorities did find out that some of the neighbors of the family who had lived there in the 50s claimed there had never been a young boy in that home at any time. And these were neighbors who had been in and out of the house on the regular. Authorities tried to get more information from the woman regarding what she told her psychiatrist. And when they spoke to her, it didn't seem like she wanted to cooperate. And at the end of the day, authorities came to the conclusion that the woman may have been suffering from some severe mental health issues. She could have believed her story, possibly it was some sort of deflection due to trauma, maybe she made it up entirely for attention. That is something we don't know. But putting all the theories aside, what we do know now is who he was in life. He has finally been identified. Like I said before, 1998 was the year they would exhume his remains to extract DNA, hoping that possibly with the advancements in technology, they would eventually get somewhere new in the case. Homicide inspector Gerald Kane was quoted by the Philadelphia Daily News saying, now that we have DNA that we didn't have in 1957, we thought it was time to secure it. They were unable to obtain any nuclear DNA from the boy's actual body, but were able to obtain mitochondrial DNA from his teeth. This would help them rule him out as being one child they thought for so many years that he could have possibly been, which was Stephen Dummon. This was also the same year that the Philadelphia police asked for help from the group VDOC, which is a crime solving group based in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The group was formed in 1990 and solved its first crime just a year later in 1991. They are made up of a lot of forensic specialists and former law enforcement. They would work alongside police for the boy in the box case for many years to come. Just like so many cases we have covered before, they had tried everything they could do to piece together what they could with what they had available at the time. They did such an incredible job, just some good old fashioned police work. The investigators who worked on this case went over everything with the tiniest magnifying glass. There were so many thousands of hours spent on this case since the very beginning, a case that would become the Philadelphia Police Department's coldest 
case. The main person who would eventually take hold of the case was someone we have discussed before, renowned genetic genealogist, Colleen Fitzpatrick. She is a co-founder of the DNA Doe Project. She is the founder of Identifinders, a fellow of the Society of Photo Optical Instrumentation Engineers, an associate member of the American Academy of Forensic Science, and a longtime member of BDOC. Genetic genealogy is truly one of her callings. She knows what she's doing and she is doing remarkable work. It is because of her that so many cases today are being solved. With so many updates in cold cases occurring because of genetic genealogy, they decided it was time to take that method and incorporate it into the potential solving of this case. If you're unfamiliar with what genetic genealogy is, it is taking a person's DNA, creating a DNA profile, putting that into a genetic database and finding familial DNA, aka family of that original person. Sometimes mapping out an entire family tree, doing a direct DNA test between a possible connection and their person and seeing if there is a relation between the two to finally discover the identity of the person they have at hand. Yeah, they exhumed the boy's remains for a second time in 2019 and the process began. According to NBC Philadelphia, Colleen compared the boy's DNA to confetti, meaning it was very old and incredibly difficult to work with and create a solid profile from. She was quoted saying, this was the most challenging case in my whole career. It took two and a half years to get the DNA in shape for proper testing. It was so bad. She goes on to say, you get a list of matches that are related to the boy. And basically if they're related to him, they're related to each other. So what we do is we take those people and it's like a big sudoku puzzle where you move them around and you use tools and finally you get a consistent picture of who is related to who and it all fits together and the one spot that's missing is the one person you're trying to identify they were eventually able to create that dna profile enter it into the dna database gedmatch and locate his second cousin once removed after locating this individual and explaining the situation to them they asked the person to see if their mother would up upload her DNA onto GEDmatch. She did, and this was the way they were able to locate the boy's biological mother. Through a court order, they were then able to obtain the boy's birth certificate and discover who the boy's biological father was. They found out that he had a birth certificate, obtained that birth certificate, and they tried to find out what his social security number may have been. Come to find out, he never was given one. After the information came out about them using genetic genealogy to help identify him, people who followed this case, including me, were kind of just sitting on the edge of their seats waiting for word regarding any updates. Well, on November 30th of this past year, the Philadelphia Police Department announced that they have officially identified him, but they did not release his name yet to the public or any background information. At the time, they just said that he came from a prominent family in Delaware County, Pennsylvania, an area about 32 miles southwest of where the boy had been found. They had actually officially identified him about a year earlier in October of 2021, but the update was kept private from the public. On December 8th though of 2022, the boy's name was finally released to the public and some information regarding where he came from and his family, but not much. The boy's name was, they say based on his birth certificate, Joseph Augustus Zarelli. He had been born on January 13th of 1953, making him only four years old at the time of his murder. And both of his parents are deceased. Philadelphia Police Captain Jason Smith said during the press conference that Joseph has a number of siblings on his mother and father's side who are still living, and it is out of respect for them that their parents' information is remaining confidential. He says, do we know who is responsible for Joseph's death? The answer at this time is unfortunately no. We have our suspicions as to who may be responsible, but it may be irresponsible for me to share those suspicions as this remains an active and ongoing criminal investigation. He says that from the press conference being done, they hope to receive an avalanche of tips. He goes on to say, we're going to filter through each and every one of those tips. And in that avalanche, there might be a diamond in the rough. I'm hopeful that there's somebody who's in their mid, late seventies, perhaps eighties, who remembers that child. The child did live until a little past the age of four years old. 
So there would have been somebody out there that would have seen this child, perhaps another family member that hasn't stepped forward, possibly a neighbor, a neighbor that remembers seeing that child, remembers whatever was occurring at that particular household. Now, I watched the entire press conference and if you're interested in knowing more about the identification process and everyone involved and what officials are saying, I definitely recommend watching it, but Jason Smith did say during it that it just happened so long ago and anyone who was alive back then and, and may have remembered anything crucial about the boy while he was alive is most likely not alive anymore. That there's unfortunately a possibility there will never be an arrest or even an identification of the killer or killers. He did say though that there is an item of clothing, an article of clothing from the crime scene that they are currently doing testing on to see if they can gather any DNA from it. There were of course a few questions from people asking more information regarding the family and they are not releasing any of that and they may never. The family has been okay with releasing a name which some question whether it is actually his real name or not his birth date, location the family was from, but that's about it. Of course, people from the public have developed their own theories and opinions based on all of this new information. People had a lot of questions they wanted answered during the press conference, but we have to remember that it is in fact an active and ongoing investigation. Some information released to the public could even all these years later jeopardize the case. But anyone with information on the case is asked to contact the Philadelphia Police Department at 215-686-TIPS, which is 215-686-8477. Authorities are offering a $20,000 reward for information that leads to an arrest and conviction in this case. So that is the case of the boy in the box, who we now know as four-year-old Joseph Augustus Zarelli. He now has a proper name to put on his headstone. He isn't just a nameless victim anymore, even though much of his actual story before his murder is not known, or at least not known to the public. I'm sure that everyone who has dove into this one has their own theories, some claiming it obvious who may have been responsible, but of course we just, we do not know the situation and that's what we have to remember. As members of the public, people who are not directly involved in the case, but do care about the case, we just kind of have to sit back and see what happens. And we never know with the advancements in technology, even Colleen Fitzpatrick said during the press conference that with every case they solve, they learn something new and get better at what they do. If there are more updates in this case, which fingers crossed, I hope there will be, I will of course do a part two. But if you wanna hear about more cases with huge updates in them, then make sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, because for the entire month of January, I am going to be covering cases that were solved in some way during last year of 2022 whether that be the person was identified or the case was fully solved. Thank you all for taking a little bit of time out of your day to hear about this case, to hear about Joseph's case, which is incredible that we finally have a name. Anyone who is interested in true crime, hands down, you have heard of this case. Even before I was interested in true crime, the boy in the box was just one of those cases. You talked about it alongside, you know, like the Black Dahlia case or Jack the Ripper, it was just, one of those cases that a lot of us really thought would never be solved in any way. It is just incredible news, but I'm gonna leave you all with that. I hope you all have a great rest of your day, wherever you are, stay safe, and I will see you all in the next one.